hello everyone. This is Sarah Espinoza. I'm Vice President for Programs at NEIF and just want to say um, thank you to our friends at NBA Cares for um, that uh, conversation and to Josh for sharing his story. Um, you know, I think throughout the day today, uh, we've heard a lot about the immense mental and physical health benefits children and all of us gain from spending time outdoors. Um, as well as how we can all leverage community resources for better health. Um, but we know that many communities still lack access or feel excluded from outdoor spaces. Recent data from the US Forest Service, National Park Service, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service shows that between 88 and 95% of all visitors to public lands are white. Um, and really breaking down barriers and establishing relationships with marginalized communities are critical steps to increasing access to parks and public lands and making sure that everyone can realize the health benefits that these places have to offer. So today I'm really pleased uh, to be welcoming a panel to discuss achieving diversity, equity and inclusion in outdoor spaces. Um, I encourage our participants to join the conversation by uh, submitting your questions through the Q&A panel um, and also by sharing your own thoughts and experiences in the chat. Uh, so I'd like to start by uh, introducing our panelists. Uh, Tennille Bustam is the National Director of Conservation Education for the USDA Forest Service. She served in various capacities uh, in the Forest Service, including National Assistant Director of Recreation at the Washington DC office, District Ranger on the Colville and Los Padres National Forests, Public Services Staff Officer at El Yunque National Forest, as well as duty stations on the Six Rivers and Lassen National Forests. Subria Spencer serves as Deputy Liaison and Communication Specialist for the National Park Service, uh, Office of Public Health in Washington, DC. Subria spearheads Your Park, Your Health, an initiative focused on innovative community-based program development led by young professionals to rebuild community relationships, inspire connectivity with nature, and establish a sense of belonging. Laura Flores is a Latino Outdoors Program Coordinator whose mission is to provide an opportunity for the Latinx community to engage and discover the national, natural beauty and rich history of New Mexico. In addition to her work with Latino Outdoors, Laura is a pre-K through fifth grade STEAM teacher uh, and shares her passion for the outdoors with her students. And last but not least, Mary Margaret Diotis is president and CEO of NEF along with an extensive background in developing holistic corporate alliances, special events, and employee engagement programs for prominent national nonprofits. Murray Margaret has worked in the environmental community to create programs that promote the benefits of outdoor activity and nurture the next generation of environmental stewards. So uh, welcome to all of our panelists, really looking forward to, uh, to this conversation. Um, and I'd like to open up by a question for all of you, which is um, kind of helping us uh, establish the, the problem, discussing some of the barriers. So what are some of the reasons historically marginalized communities, including people of color, do not visit public lands? So Sarah, you got Tennille here. I'll kick us off since I'm the representing national public lands here. Um, you know, in thinking about it for me, I, I, I know that there are um, members of minority groups that historically have not been involved in decision-making when forests were established. And I think that's part of what's happened and just looking at our agency through time, what our agency has looked like um, is a representation of what our visitors look like, right? So we were established in 1905 by Gifford Pinchot, very elite from you know New York City. Um, he was probably influenced by a lot of his contemporaries, uh, people like uh, authors like Thoreau and John Muir, who looked just like him. Um, and then think about like the politicians that he was engaged with, like Teddy Roosevelt, who set aside 
over 150 million acres of forest. Um, and then, you know, how they inspired visitation at that time, it was for people with opportunity, right? It was people that had money, who could afford to go to the forest, who had a vehicle to drive there, who could afford to hire a stagecoach or a horse to get around the forest when they were there, who could afford a guide to um, provide activities like some very informal mountaineering, some paddling in a canoe, you know, maybe some picnicking, but all of that, you know, cost money. And so it was for people with opportunity and, and you know, with vehicles. And so it was very restricted to who that included, right? Um, and so it was people that looked just like the founder of our agency, you know, and then I think about, you know, in the 30s through the 60s, there was segregation, you know, there was actual signs up in the forest that said whites only. Um, and I work with lots of people in the agency that recall in their careers being a part of pulling some of those signs down. So um, that that is a part of our history, you know, and that exists. Um, but I also recognize that there's folks, you know, contemporary thinkers and thought leaders from gender and racial minorities that have really influenced how we think about visitation today and think about how we manage lands today that affects visitation. You know, and I, I was trying to put together some ideas of who those people are. And there's so many, but I wanted to mention a few because they are just really prominent, like Rachel Carson in 1962, right? We finally got a woman in the scene. It took that long, but we got a woman on the scene. Um, we've got 1970s Dr. Robert Bullard, the father of environmental justice, talking about African-American communities in Houston being developed on landfills, um, but getting minority engagement in planning. Uh, Chico Mendez in the 80s, saving his forest in his home country of Brazil. Um, 2008, Lisa Perez Jackson, the first African-American woman and the fourth woman to hold a, a, a position as administrator of EPA. And then today, Deb Holland for DOI, right? Our first Native American cabinet uh, secretary for DOI. So all those folks influence, you know, our thought leaders in our agency. And if we are still representing um, a segment of our visitation or all of our visitation, what does our agency look like? We have a ways to go. So we have, you know, we still have, you know, we're making strides when it comes to gender and racial minorities in the agency of the Forest Service, but we still have so far to go. We have about, I think it's like, we have 35% of our top leadership is made up of racial minorities, but it doesn't look like that in the field. And we are still only 34% female. So we do have a ways to go. And in terms of our visitation, we have, like we said, uh, like you said before, Sarah, we, our visitation most recent count showed 95% white, 6% um, uh, Hispanic and Latino. But that's just our visitation to forests. That is just the recreation visits. It's actual forests and grasslands. We as an agency reach so many more lands, over 500 million acres of lands that uh, belong to states, uh, tribes, uh, uh, private lands, working forests. And together in partnership with these groups, we are able to outreach to a, a, a bigger group, right? Larger numbers. And so what I wanted to share with you all today is that when it comes to conservation education and the, our visitation numbers, uh, how we outreach and educate, we've actually seen record setting years. This year, this last year was a record for us. We reached 14 million people. And of those, 81% were Latino and 67% were, were female. So I simply share that because I know we're gonna talk about strategies and uh, we have some strategies to get there, um, but our numbers are not, uh, the visitation numbers don't always reflect how, what we're doing in efforts to reach all the, all the groups that we reach. Thanks for the question. Hello everyone, this is Sabria Spencer. I'm just gonna add a couple more notes um, after to Neil, just thinking about some of the barriers and conversations I've had with um, peers, family members, and just in general, the black community. Um, first off, you know, there is a lot of historical trauma 
um, that's taken place. Uh, you know, I think that that is no secret uh, when it comes to outdoor spaces, not only uh, those spaces being segregated, but because of years and years of slavery, because of so many other things that have taken place. And so that sort of fear, um, you know, the unknown, that trauma really is passed down through generations. And so when you have elders or you have grandparents that never had access or never had an opportunity to participate in some of those recreational activities, they're, you know, then not able to pass it on to their children. And so um, through some of our work in the Office of Public Health and um, a couple of other projects I'll mention later, we really found that this is still present today uh, for a lot of people. Um, the other side of that is that there are individuals that have visited um, parks that have spent time outdoors, but have had very negative experiences. And so, um, you know, they're kind of first time park goers and never return um, because of lack of representation, because of some sort of racial or discriminatory incident. Um, and so, these things, these issues are very much alive and well um, and, and still very difficult for a lot of individuals to deal with. You know, I think even when we're looking at older generations and, and thinking about grandparents, there's also still sort of this skepticism uh, for younger individuals that might say, hey, I want to be a park ranger. Hey, I want to do this um, because of governmental impact as well. So different agencies, organizations coming into communities and wanting to implement uh, projects, um, you could say, or implement initiatives that might be trying to connect them to the outdoors. But when there's not an established relationship, when people don't see themselves in these spaces, then there, there's not gonna be a connection. And you're not gonna really have the opportunity to form those uh, sort of lifelong lasting behaviors and health practices that you could by engaging in the outdoors. Um, but definitely excited to continue this conversation today and get more into what we're doing at the National Park Service. If I might add, thank you, Sabria. That was exactly what I was thinking. Um, I, I, I'm more on, on the ground um, having conversations. We take groups of the community out, but those are the conversations that we have, right? The lack of representation is really what holds our community back um, or they've had a negative experience. Another conversation that we have is transportation, reliable transportation. How can we, how can we get our community there, right? What are the costs that are associated with, with getting to um, anywhere in nature? and equipment. So a lot of people think, oh, you have to buy the Patagucci, right? You have to have, you, know, you have to have the ex expensive equipment. Um, so the knowledge of how to enjoy the outdoors, um, you know, whether, whether you do get that equipment or not, how can we make sure and ensure that, um, that we're enjoying it without it costing an arm and a leg? I would only add one more thing, Sarah. Thank you for the opportunity to be with such great colleagues and partners. Um, we've certainly learned a lot at NEEP over the last couple of years, particularly through our, our partnership with National Park Service with the Power of Health Roundtables with different communities, the Black community, the AAPI community. We're about to do one around um, accessibility for the, the disabled community and echo everything that you all have said. Those stories have come out, um, whether it's uh, as you mentioned, Sabria, the, the Black culture and the fear of being on public lands. We heard that from the AAPI community with internment camps. Um, Tanil, as you said, the accessibility and Laura, right, that these, these places were set up by white people and weren't easily accessible. I think the other thing, just tagging on to what Laura, you just said, that's really important is you don't, it's not only about your gear, right? You don't need to have the latest and greatest, most expensive gear, but as visitors to these places, I think we all have a responsibility to accept those who don't have that gear and maybe are recreating as a family and are in more um, perhaps traditional garb, garb to their culture. They're, they're not, um, you know, decked out in their REI outfits or whatever it is that we deem is the right way to appear or show up on our public lands. Um, so the way that the, they are enjoying those public lands, whether it's picnicking with extended family or it's hiking or it's just taking a walk with their family, 
um, are really important and, and all of us who see them to welcome them. That actually came out really loud and clear in a couple of the round tables, just uh, the rest of us welcoming them for however they show up and want to appreciate and enjoy uh, these public lands, I think is really important. Well, thanks you all for, for kind of laying that foundation for our conversation. And, you know, I heard a number of things, certainly physical barriers to access, transportation, proximity, uh, financial barriers, social barriers, historical barriers, intergenerational trauma. So there are really a lot of things at, at play here that affect how um, various communities interact with, with green spaces. Um, and I'd like to take a little time now to hear from each of you about your work and how you're addressing some of these, these barriers through that work. Um, Tanil, I'm gonna come back to you um, and ask you a little bit about uh, how you're working to connect new communities to U.S. forests. Um, I know you've been doing some work with uh, Latinx communities in particular through Descubre el Bosque, um, uh, a Spanish language website for young people to connect them to nature. Um, and would love it if you can tell us a little bit about how you're tackling some of the barriers you mentioned and, and what some of your successes have been in that work. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Sarah. So for us, our efforts have really been focusing on the narrative, right? And shifting the narrative, like a lot of what you all are doing. Um, and we're doing this through uh, mostly uh, our marketing. Um, and we have some marketing campaigns that are really helping us with this. And so our marketing campaigns are promoting people of color and role modeling family-centric and positive nature experiences. And like you mentioned, we're doing that through Discover the Forest. Uh, that's a campaign, like I said, that targets Black and Latino parents, um, particularly of preteens, with messaging on positive nature affinity, the health benefits of nature, and intergenerational learning opportunities in nature. Um, and it also drives traffic to park, a park locator, it's a zip code locator, uh, for users to find a forest near them. Um, and our surveys, we conduct monthly surveys, they actually show an increase of awareness of nature as a place to recreate in and, and of sites to go to. Um, so that's one way that we're you know, creating uh, this space and shifting this narrative is through Discover the Force. And so we have a Spanish language component to that and that's Descubre el Bosque, which Sarah, you mentioned. And that component is huge for us reaching, you know, lots of different uh, groups. Again, focused on um, the Spanish language component. So it's the Latino uh, population and Hispanic populations um, and getting opportunities for them to not only use the site to get outside, but also uh, the resources that are provided there. There's some formal and informal educational resources on the site that they can use, some activity guides that they can use while they're on the ground and, and experiencing the outdoors. Um, and then also Corazon Latino, who is our partner with Descubre El Bosque. They host a, a plethora of social media around Descubre El Bosque and they provide a host of events that uh, they invite you know, the Latino and Hispanic communities to join. Um, and so there is a broad outreach through that partnership with Corazon Latino. And that is a huge reason why our uh, Latino and Hispanic numbers for conservation education are so large is the work through Descubre El Bosque and Corazon Latino's assistance um, in that partnership. The other campaign I want to make mention of, because it's a really important one and it's forest service wide, it's in partnership with the National Forest Foundation and it's called It's All Yours. And It's All Yours is basically getting at the forest. They belong to everyone, the forest and the grasslands. They are all yours to enjoy, to play in, to be a steward for, to care for. They are all yours. Um, and so not only are they, they yours to enjoy, but they're yours to benefit from, right? Because ecosystem services are provided by the forest. We get clean water from forests. All, so much drinking water actually comes from national forests to Americans. We get clean air, we get timber for the houses that we live in, the furniture that uh, the chair I'm sitting on, you know, the bridges that are built, the buildings and the homes that are built. 
So, so much of those ecosystem services come from forests and those are some of the benefits. And then also not to mention all of the many health benefits that come from engaging and connecting in nature. Um, and I know we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. Um, so a couple of those uh, ad campaigns, I just wanna underscore that work there. It's, it's really about you know, how we're reaching people where they are um, and focusing on some of those, those marketing campaigns. Thanks, Danielle. And I, I heard one thing in there that I think has come up a, a few times today, which is the role that parents play in all of this and, and targeting parents as a, a positive force in, in making some of those connections. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Laura, I know you are also working uh, closely with the Latino community um, through your work with Latino Outdoors. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the strategies you use to connect your community with outdoor spaces and, and how you help Latinx communities feel safe and welcome in these spaces. Absolutely. Uh, so um, at the Latino Outdoors Albuquerque chapter, we have, we have four official volunteers, uh, three of whom are educators. So we are kind of just planting the seeds in our schools and in our communities. We're reaching out to local organizations um, with Latinx populations who want to get their, their kids outside. Um, we've been fortunate enough here in New Mexico um, to get this fund through the Outdoor, um, outdoor Equity Fund. Um, and so it's supplying funds for, um, for any outdoor activity that our youth would like. Um, there is a push for a national bill the, called the Outdoor Future so that every state has these funds to, to get kids outside. Um, but jointly with, with Latino Outdoors and the Outdoor Future, the Outdoor Future is for 0 through 18. And with Latino Outdoors, we have those extra funds to bring in families, right? Again, to encourage those families to come in to enjoy nature with, with their children. Um, a lot of the time too, we offer intros. So introduction into fishing, into kayaking, um, into birding. And this gives the opportunity for, for, for kids just to ask questions, for parents to ask questions and feel comfortable with, with people who look like them, who have the same questions as them, you know, who, who they, can feel, they can feel like they can be themselves, whether it's loud, whether it's, you know, silent, because sometimes that's what it is too, you know, our community, I know that I'm a really loud person and I talk with my hands and I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm just very uh, vocal. And sometimes that's, that's not appreciated if you're trying to bird, right? If you're going birding, because you might scare the birds, but if you have those conversations before, or you feel like, oh, I can still ask these conversations. I can still, I can, I can still be myself, look for porcupines, whatever. Um, we, we reach out through Instagram, through Facebook, again, through, um, through our schools, through the local organizations. Um, I know that we bring in national park, um, park rangers in anywhere that we go that way people feel um feel connected to the park rangers it's not this scary person in um in a suit you know that that can be off-putting sometimes um so they can come in bring in history we add our history um again we just want to make sure that we we're bringing in culture that we're bringing in family, that we are making everybody feel comfortable and, and reaching out to our underserved communities the best that we can. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I, I think the theme of being able to try, right, try things out without judgment um, and ask questions and have those experiences is just so important in, in really making that these places feel more welcome. Um, so thank you. Uh, Subria, your work is also really focused on building relationships with, um, with communities. Um, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your park, your health. Um, so working with young people to build relationships with communities, uh, encourage connections to nature and, and build a sense of belonging. Um, what does this look like in practice? And, and what are some of your successes with uh, your park, your health? Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so Your Parker Health is a program within the Office of Public Health in the National Park Service um, that's kind of a two-part program. So the main focus is on the internship aspect 
we're actually working with Greeny Youth Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that provides opportunities to young people across the country to engage um, with federal agencies and get involved in uh, outdoor activities, health related projects, um, and really just have an opportunity to see uh, employment, op uh, employment options they may not have considered before. Um, and so we're fortunate to have Green Youth interns work with our Your Park Your Health program to implement community-based projects. Um, so essentially they are part of the planning and implementation process um, for our audiences. And so we're focusing on golden age individuals, which are senior citizens, but we refer to them as golden age. Um, we're also focusing on elementary school kids and middle school kids, as well as high school and college youth aged um, individuals, and then also military families. And so um, this program was actually uh, established and kind of concept conceptualized in 2016 by our deputy director, Sonia Coakley, because um, she really just saw a need for young people to have an opportunity to get involved, to learn about the National Park Service, um, and really just consider other options for their future. So we've had um, 14 interns so far in counting um, that have you know, joined us and worked on really interesting projects. There's one innovative project that I will mention um, that we finished up trying to think of what year this is, 2021, uh, 2019. Um, so I came into park service actually as a CDC associate with the PHAP program, public health associate program. And while um, interning and doing this training program in the Office of Public Health, I was able to actually work on a film um, called 20 and Odd. And so there were other individuals who were Green and Youth interns at the time who were also able to come up with the script, come up with scenes and develop this film uh, that was part of the 400 years of African-American history and culture, this commission to really recognize 1619, to recognize Fort Monroe, which is a National Park Service site um, and honor uh, some of the first individuals that uh, were essentially taken um, and brought to the United States in 1619. And so um, with this project, and it's the first of its kind, a short film, about four minutes, 20 seconds. Um, but with this project, we were able to really focus on, you know, our culture. So focus on a history that is really connected to who we are, to our, to our families, to, um, to individuals that we know. And so through this effort, we were able to travel to different park sites. Um, so we went down to the south, we're able to visit uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge and we're able to go to MLK's birth home um, and really focus on, you know, not only being interns and fellows a part of this program and connecting to our history and connecting to opportunities there, but also helping individuals in those communities um, learn and understand that their history is in the national parks. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of misconceptions, again, and unknowns about what the National Park Service is, if you even have heard of it before. And so in our travels, a lot of individuals said, well, you know, I knew of MLK's birth home, but I didn't know what the National Park Service was, you know, or I've been to uh, Tuskegee Airmen site, but I didn't know that it was connected to a larger agency or a larger organization, you know, that is responsible for maintaining um, and taking care of, you know, my history. Um, and so through these very innovative sort of niche uh, projects, we're able to engage with youth and different audiences in, in many different ways. But um, your Parker Health is still very much in this sort of development transition stage um, we are looking sort of towards the future and how we can make this a more sustainable program um, and hopefully take what has been sort of a pilot uh, project in the DC metro area and expand it nationwide. So, you know, eventually we'd love to have interns based at regional levels within the National Park Service or at specific parks implementing programs that are tailored for specific communities in those areas. 
Um, and so that is the goal. That is the hope. Uh, you know, we, we definitely appreciate our partnership with NEF and other organizations that have helped to support us along the way. Um, yeah, and definitely looking forward to, to what the future holds for that. Thanks, Subria. Yeah, and I, um, I know I've seen a question in the chat here about sharing resources. We will be sure to get links out to everyone. And um, uh, having seen 20 and odd, I can speak to how powerful that film is and, and what a great job it does of telling the story of Black history in our national parks and really making those, those connections. So thank you for, for sharing that. And, um, great to see how you're engaging young people in, in really making those uh, community connections. Um, Mary Margaret, so speaking of uh, community connections, NEF hosts National Public Lands Day, which is the nation's uh, largest single day volunteer event for public lands, um, and also provides grants for events and conservation projects on public lands year round. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you are working to ensure that historically marginalized communities are included and engaged in these activities? Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, just another uh, applause for 20 and odd, and we will put the link in the chat. It's a fabulous film. And thank you, Sabria, for, for helping create it. It was uh, really a great experience and launched the uh, Power of Health Roundtable series I mentioned earlier. Um, when talking about National Public Lands Day, we're very proud of our signature program, uh, for sure, uh, as an organization that's really looking to connect people with uh, the health, their health and the health of the planet. Uh, this is an important part of our work. And speaking just in, in our short conversation here, the importance of bringing people out for the first time to public lands. Uh, we find that the, our participants for National Public Lands Day, about three quarters of them are first time visitors to the park. So we're helping hopefully open that gateway and that opportunity for them to learn more about what might be in their neighborhood or around their neighborhood and experience uh, parks in a different way, ones that they've maybe never been to before. In terms of the work that we're doing around ensuring uh, marginalized communities are involved in uh, public lands, I would just highlight a couple. I could talk for hours, but um, I'll just highlight a couple. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we do give grants. Um, so we are doing two things right now around our grant program. Once, one is uh, our restoration and resilient grant program. As you guys all know, with COVID, we are seeing an increase uh, visitation to public lands across the country um, and really need to focus on how to rebuild those those places. So we launched a grant program with about $260,000 with public and private funding, which is focusing on conservation, accessibility, maintenance, and cultural and historical uh, preservation. So there's an opportunity for us to really look at not just um, the the wear and tear, so to speak, on, on our public lands, but also how we're looking at inviting in and making other these marginalized communities feel more welcome on public lands. And I'll give you a couple of examples of the application of the grants that we've we've funded. Um, we've had a, quite a, a bit of uh, applications. There's a big need here, over 400, and we've been funding about 15% of those. But one of them, uh, for example, in Connecticut was funding to uh, they realized in this park that they didn't have uh, signage in uh, or any interpretation or interpretive staff at all that um, could appeal to and, and communicate with the Latinx community. So uh, giving them funding to make sure that uh, not all of the guidance was in English, but was welcoming other folks to understand where to go and how to get help and, and how to recreate responsibly was really important to them. Um, we've also done some work around uh, in Wisconsin around outreach to the indigenous people in the community, uh, bringing them into the park. Uh, another one in Wisconsin was accessible and uh, helping build an accessible kayak launch site for folks that uh, might not be able or that are physically challenged and that took that has uh, funding is in Alabama. So that's one of the ways that we're leveraging our grant making uh, to bring more folks into national public lands. The second way I'm really excited about is, you know, as we've been on this DEI journey at at, uh, at NEF for several years, we because we have the ability to do grants. How are we granting money to communities of color and marginalized community? So one of the things we're doing right now is engaging with Price Waterhouse Coopers for a, a, 
a pro bono engagement, really looking at a, our current grant making strategy and how it could better align with our commitment to DEI. So we need to make sure that we're clearly articulating that in our criteria for our grants, but also in our promotion and our outreach to bring more folks into the process to be eligible for some of this money. And the second piece of that is not just uh, the way that we're giving out the money, but the way or the way that we're uh, looking at our grant applications, but how we're giving out the money. And just a recent example, we had a small group, a friends group in Hawaii apply for a grant um, around public lands, not MPLD specifically. Um, and because they were small, they didn't have all the criteria that we would normally have as a grant making organization. So with some hustle with our team and, and talking to our accounts, we're actually going to be able to provide funding to this group and just uh, relax our, our requirements, but still stay clear in terms of being responsible with the money by checking in with them more frequently. So I think that's a really important lesson for all of us who are in the op who have the opportunity to give money that we need to understand that we need to be more flexible in how we do that. Still be responsible, but be more flexible. Just a couple of other areas. We are really acknowledging and listening to communities of color. Um, we've already talked about the Power of Parks Roundtable that we love with Sabria and National Park Service understanding experiences from people with different backgrounds and, and uh, how they can, how they feel safe or how they want to experience public lands or how public lands have really been influential in their lives. We heard a little bit about that from Josh Powell and the power of being outside, um, but also land acknowledgements, right? Is the nation's uh, largest conductor of National Public Lands Day, the largest volunteer effort on public lands. Uh, we are putting together land acknowledgement toolkits for all of our land managers. Um, so we can uh, acknowledge the, the, the places that we're on and the indigenous people and the tribe, tribal land that, that these events take place on. And then we're also expanding our partnerships with affinity groups. Um, we work also with Corazon Latino, Green 2.0. We're looking to expand in other areas. And we're actually about to launch a big promotion uh, with Toyota around access to public lands for uh, folks that are uh, uh, challenge mobility wise or uh, otherwise disabled. So there'll be more coming around that and we'll be doing grants out to another set of parks to help increase uh, that access. Thanks, yes, and, and having read many of those grant applications myself, <laughs> I can say it's been really interesting throughout the pandemic to see so many public land sites realizing that um, more people than ever are showing up and they need to figure out how to accommodate uh, new ways of using the parks and new communities who are, are showing up and, and really wanting to, to keep them engaged. Um, I, I'm going to turn to a, a, an, a question from our, um, our participants here that's related really to the barriers and it's that safety in parks was a concern that came up earlier today. Um, the importance of having safe, accessible green spaces in every neighborhood being critical. Um, and the question is what efforts are being done to improve perceived safety uh, in neighborhoods and green spaces? Are there existing programs uh, that, for example, install lights and cameras in local parks or, or provide other uh, safety accommodations? So I'll open that up to, to everyone to see if there's any, um, any uh, feedback there. So I guess I can chime in. I am not aware of specific programs um, that are focusing on sort of those community uh, changes or implementations regarding safety. Uh, I will just mention for overall safety, we have an Office of Risk Management within the, the, within the National Park Service, excuse me, uh, that focuses on injuries specifically. But when it comes to certain communities, um, you know, engaging in parks, I really am not sure of a lot of um, specific agencies that work on that. I know on the individual park level, um, there are partnerships and there are sort of initiatives that have been implemented. Um, one thing about the National Park Service, if you're not familiar, is that every park sort of operates on its own. So when it comes to certain, um, enhancements or certain procedures, it's really very much park-based. 
Um, and I would say it's also a challenge at times, um, you know, as a National Park Service employee, but someone who is Black and connected to the Black community, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to suggest uh, that individuals or my family members visit some parks because although I know the health benefits and although I know, you know, how rewarding it can be to experience nature, I, I can't guarantee their safety in those spaces you know, not from wildlife or from individuals. Um, so that's definitely a challenge, but something we're also thinking about in terms of your park, your health um, and going forward, how are we at least able to create opportunities that are within a safe space and that are um, set up to really be inviting and welcoming to the communities we're trying to reach. But would love to hear other thoughts on that. Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. I would share that, you know, for the Forest Service, you know, and the work that I can only speak to the work that we do, right, in conservation education. And for us, you know, we really focus on providing those opportunities that, you know, are uh, comfortable, right? And we encourage, you know, engagement at the most comfortable level for whomever is coming to our forest or whomever is engaging in one of our events. And, you know, for, you know, being um, a Hispanic woman and coming from a Hispanic family, we're a gregarious type of people, right? Our culture is very gregarious. We like to get together in a family and in, in a big group. And, and so when we are thinking about, you know, that's me personally, but when we're thinking about providing those experiences for Latino and Hispanic populations uh, in the Forest Service, we are providing for families like mine that can get together in a really large group and, you know, and be next to another really large group of Hispanic and Latino families um, and have those opportunities. And so we do that, you know, not only in the actual infrastructure that we provide, um, but we also do that, you know, and the infrastructure is, you know, large and spacious enough to do that. Even during the pandemic, we've been able to keep some of our locations open in such a way that can provide some opportunities with social distancing um, for that to happen. Um, and then in terms of the, um, you know, the programs that we offer, it's offered in the same vein, right? So we're looking to provide uh, opportunities through virtual media that can meet people where they are. They can go out in groups. They can go out, you know, with others um, to encourage that, that feeling of safety that they, that um, may be helpful, or even if it's, maybe not even safety, but it's just a level of comfortability. Um, and so providing those, those virtual opportunities, but also then the, the workshops and the events and the work that we do through Coda San Latino um, really inspires those, uh, that type of platform. Just one more point to add through the Restoration Resilient Fund. I was actually reviewing some grants as well, Sarah, and one of the grant proposals was funding for automatic restroom locks. Um, so when the park closes at dark, um, they can program the restroom to lock for safety and then same in, in the morning. So I think there are some more um, uh, built environment things that we should be looking at and it's a good opportunity to look at, you know, is, is lighting an issue or other things that might be able to be enhanced on some of these, uh, through some of these restoration resilience um, grants that would increase safety. So another question here from, um, from our participants, and I think uh, this has been touched on earlier as well in terms of a barrier, is that some parks are cost prohibitive for families. Um, and how, you know, how is this being addressed or what are some of the ways that um, that we can overcome that particular barrier. So I know with Latino Outdoors, um, you know, we don't charge families anything. Um, when they sign up to go on our outings, um, all, all costs are waived. 
um, because we do want families to enjoy the outdoors. So, you know, we provide lunches, we provide um, transportation, you know, we, we provide everything in order to get our families outside and educate them on, on the area or, or just to experience the area. Um, and, and so that's, that's the beauty of this organization is that, you know, you don't have to have, you don't have to have the funds because we're going to take care of you. Um, but that's not the case everywhere. Right. So I'm going to leave that open to everybody else. What, what else are we doing? Well, I'll jump in for the forest service. Most of, nearly all of our sites are, are free. There are very few that you have to pay for and the sites that do you do pay for, it's like for a visitor center, you still have access to the entire unit. Um, even Gray Towers National Historic Site, you still have access to the ground. So um, all of our units, the public has access to. But what I will share um, for my colleagues that have units that are fee charging units, um, there is a program that you all are probably aware of that could always use advocacy and support. And that's the Every Kid Outdoors program. Um, and that's something that is provides passes to fourth graders um, and I think fifth graders now too, possibly. Um, and so that's, and their families and to get them out in, you know, on the unit and get them there for free. Um, their educators can also uh, apply for or receive a pass as well to bring their classrooms, their fourth and fifth grade classrooms out to the field for free. Um, but it needs advocacy because, you know, it's been uh, ages since that legislation has actually had any funding associated with it. And it's one of those things that if we want to get kids out on the landscape, you know, having some funds to put them in a bus and bring them out there is sure going to help. So just flagging it for our folks out there in the ether and in the participant land that it's just a program that really needs support and championing. Now I'll just add quickly, um, I'm glad that you brought up the Every Kid in the Park. I was gonna mention that I think some of the ways that a lot of different individuals are finding uh, possibly free access to parks is through outside organizations or other youth related programs. Um, so if you haven't visited uh, the MPS youth program site, that is definitely a great way, although it's focusing on youth, a great way to find um, ways to engage in parks, uh, whether it's through Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or uh, Youth Conservation Corps, some of the other programs that are um, in place great ways to get access. Um, and I think someone mentioned earlier for our programs as well, when it comes to your park, your health, we are covering some of those costs and working with organizations that have funds to be able to cover it um, because that is a real burden. And we don't want uh, the innovative projects that we're doing to be you know, off limits because of, of those barriers. So. Um, definitely look into other community-based organizations because they're doing really great work to connect individuals to parks. The last thing I would just add is that National Public Lands Day is a fee-free day. So um, not only do you get to come to sort of promoting our, our activity, but our partners are here too. So you get to come out to uh, the parks for free that day and get a pass for another visit. It doesn't solve the problem, I acknowledge, but it is one step in the right direction. Um, in addition to our great national uh, public lands, there's also city, county, smaller parks that are, are uh, often free. So it, that takes a, a bit more effort for sure. Um, but maybe part of it is shifting the conversation of you can experience the outdoors and recreate outdoors without no offense to our national park and forest service friends without going to one of those properties. Um, there's other levels of engagement throughout, throughout the country. And, and that would be a way for folks to be able to at least uh, connect outside in, in a way that doesn't cost uh, cost some of the fees that other places do. Thanks. Um, so we've we've talked a lot about uh, barriers and some of the work that's happening to increase access to green spaces um, uh, and and build comfort in those spaces. And I'd like to switch gears a little bit and um, uh, ask about how our audience, which is comprised of many health professionals, uh, physicians, nurses, community and public health professionals, others, 
um, can be allies and, and support this work? Um, what messages can they be sharing uh, with their own um, uh, constituents, children and caregivers and others to encourage engagement and, and connection with green space? Hey, I'll jump in, Sarah. I think one of the, some of the messages that can be shared, and I really appreciate that question because it really got me thinking about, okay, so what are the messages that you want to communicate here, Tamil, when it comes to children and the nature connection and, you know, getting outside and what does that, what does that look like? Um, and I think that the message from the Forest Service is that, you know, and it's probably similar for others, is that access to green space and really quality green space has a lot of many, many benefits, right? It's related to positive cognitive, mental, physical, social, and emotional health out outcomes. And then also other outcomes related to personal developmental outcomes. Um, and having a, a lack of access to green space uh, has a link to higher mortality, lower physical activity, higher rates of depression, higher prevalence of chronic disease, um, all those things. But the positive side is, is that green space provides uh, protection of health by providing carbon sequestration, regulating temperature. Um, it also provides proximity of, of green space, uh, results in higher propensity for physical activity, getting outside, right, um, which supports our overall health. Um, and in the U.S., there are 62% of um, uh, Anglo children who have park spaces within close distance of their neighborhoods, it'd be great to um, expand that to some other marginalized communities and see what we can do to create some greening in the cities and greening in the communities, some uh, development of some green infrastructure in some areas that um, could use it, could use a little greening. Um, so that's, for me, that's the, uh, that's, that's the message that could be shared is all the, the many benefits that um, green spaces provide. And just echoing that as well, something that we always say in the Office of Public Health and the National Park Service is that parks are a health resource. Um, so we've talked about mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health. They are truly a resource for everyone. Um, and something that we often do or we have each year is the Parker X Day, Parker X program um, in which uh, physicians, prescribers are able to actually prescribe nature as an alternative to medicine. So it's not to say that medicine is bad or not necessary at times, but you know, nature could be an alternative or help supplement some of the issues that individuals may be experiencing. And so um, even through your park, your health for individuals that have diabetes or high blood pressure, we've been able to do some engagement activities outside um, coupled with the medication they may be taking to just try to offer other alternatives. So um, I would definitely say just pushing that parks are a health resource too um, and can be prescribed as part of someone's overall health, um, you know, is really important and really necessary for all of us, um, not just physically, but especially mentally. Having that stress uh, relieving outlet is critical, especially during this time. So Parks are a health resource if you remember nothing else. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. I agree 100%. It's a health resource. Parks are also an educational resource, right? I think about the sensory, the tactile, the visual, the, audio, the auditory learning. Um, so just promoting that it's health, it's education, it's spiritual. Um, and leading by example, right? Maybe even sharing your stories about how the outdoors has impacted your life, um, because that that will really encourage people to go outside. I love the idea of leading by example, or it makes me think of what Josh Powell just said, right? He said, do as I do as a parent um, <laughs> with your kids. And as the parent of 13 year old, I live that every single day. 
Um, but also the message I think for being, again, being a parent, your health professionals are so trusted, right? Um, certainly as, as a parent, when you go to the pediatrician, your, your pediatrician has a lot of influence on your decision-making um, for the parent and also for the child or the, you know, the actual patient. And we should remember how important that is. And I know that our healthcare professionals have been working so hard during this really, really difficult time um, but listening and understanding maybe some of the barriers from the, the family uh, that comes in and trying to overcome them. And I love the idea that you said, Laura, of telling their own story of what they did and how they used uh, the outdoors or nature or connecting in some small way or a larger way really influenced um, their overall health and well-being. I think those are, are, are things that probably our healthcare providers are doing, but just from uh, the need standpoint and also from a parental standpoint, I think that's so valuable. They are such trusted messengers in helping us deal with some of the staggering stats that Dr. Smith sh shared earlier in terms of our kids' mental health, particularly these days. Thanks, and I, I think you know something that has has come up in this and other conversations is also the opportunity to. Um, uh, share that spending time outside or in green space does not necessarily mean you have to go to a national park, right? It can be your backyard. It can be um, seeing nature um, can even be powerful. So I, I think that's another message that our healthcare providers can share is that um, it doesn't have to be uh, something that feels inaccessible. It can be your own neighborhood or, or your own community. So we're coming up uh, to the end of our time here, unfortunately, but I wanted to give everybody a, a chance for a final word. Um, so I, I'd like to end with this, which is what is one key action you hope our audience today will take away uh, and apply in um, their medical or health practice or their lives following, uh, following this discussion? Hey, Sarah, I'll go with that one. Thank you for that question. And thank you for our wonderful panel. Um, I appreciate being a part of this and always value the partnership with me. Um, the last message I would share, um, one thing before I share it though, is just a, a shout out to Lisa Perez. I noticed in the chat, she put a link into the um, Urban Connections program for Detroit. So I encourage you all to take a look at that really outstanding program. Um, so I wanted to make a plug there. And then for a last, thought to share with this group is would be it, it's all yours, right? So public lands belong to you, they, yours, your family, all of those you know, love and care for and beyond. They are for everyone. Um, so they're yours to explore, they're yours to care for, and they're yours to benefit from. So the action I would say would be get out there, go out there and enjoy them. So I, again, <laughs> echo that same sentiment of, you know, the parks, national parks, any of the local state parks are yours. Um, you know, these spaces are truly waiting for you. I think as providers, uh, we definitely want to stress uh, viewing yourself as an ambassador of parks, as an ambassador for health and that connection. Um, someone mentioned earlier that you are likely an individual that knows a lot about uh, the children and the families that you're working with, a lot of their backgrounds and experiences. And so you may be the first person to introduce them to something that could be life-changing um, and help them as they continue to navigate this journey. So uh, you are a health ambassador, you are a park ambassador, um, and just you know, thank you for all the work that you're doing. I think that Subria and Chanel said everything beautifully. <laughs> I don't know that I can add much more um, just because it, it is so true, right? Get outside, take care of, take care of the outdoors, take care of yourself um, and take care of the community, right? And, and Sarah, I 100% I agree that it, 
out the outdoors doesn't have to be a destination, right? Go outside, put your feet in the grass, look out the window, look at the hummingbirds, you know, just appreciate it. If you have a small garden in your, in your kitchen, even with herbs, um, you know, that in itself can be kind of just experiencing nature. Um, so, so look at it in different perspectives and really listen to your, you know, to your, your patients and listen to your community. Um, and again, just, just enjoy it and be, and be positive in, in nature. Thank you. 100% agree. Keep it simple and have baby steps, right, to that destination if that's where you want to go. Um, but continuing to rely on the power of our healthcare professionals to help keep us healthy and help broaden our horizons in terms of how we take care of ourselves by making that connection to the outdoors and nature. Thanks. Well, thanks to all of our panelists for this great discussion, um, for, for sharing your stories and your work. I, I'm sure like many other discussions today, we could go on for another hour or two if we wanted to, um, but uh, lots of resources shared in the chat and we will follow up with everyone uh, with additional resources. And of course, those are also things that our healthcare providers can draw on and share with, uh, with their communities.